Hi everyone, welcome to Street Foods with Nikki. It's my chance to have you come around the globe with me and try all the things that I was lucky enough to taste when I traveled a lot when I was younger and older. Same thing every time around. I always try the street foods in all the countries that I've been in and I want you to try them with me. So today we're gonna be making my family heritage favorite, so Italian. We've got the three Ps. We've got panna cotta, which is delicious. We've got pancetta and we've got panzerotti. And so those are gonna actually fill you up and they're really great and things you can find on the streets of Italy when you're walking around and go from stall to stall. So they're always a little bit different flavor, but equally delicious. So please enjoy yourself. And if things go wrong in the kitchen, don't worry about it. Just keep coming back and, and start anew. And it's your, your chance to kind of remake the recipe over and over again with me. All right, let's get started on our first recipe, panna cotta. So it's like a custard, and I always say that it's as if flan and creme brulee had a baby. It's, it's kind of together, it's kind of jiggly, but it's that perfect kind of a cream. So to begin, we're gonna take a nice pan, and we have to have a little bit of a lip to it, so you wanna have it a little thicker, not a large, large straight edge pan, but something small. You're gonna mix together in a cold pan, guys, no, no scalding the milk. A heavy cream and half and half. We're gonna pour that in, and then I always add a little bit of salt at the very start. Now a little bit to me is a big pinch and just turn it around, just kind of open it up a little bit. And we're gonna go ahead and keep our vanilla off to the side. So we're gonna turn on over, we're gonna come over to the heat and we're gonna put it on to a medium low flame. Now whenever I see medium low or I hear medium low, as my students know back home, I tend to go high just because of kitchens and I'm used to not having the time to go low and slow. So we wanna kinda of watch it though because cream tends to explode if you don't watch it for too long. So we're gonna heat that up a little bit. Now remember, recipes may say boil it. Recipes may say bring it to a simmer. I disagree. We wanna heat it just enough so that it'll come together and the flavors will come out because heat and salt add the flavor. It's gonna make it kind of have a little punch to it. All right, so we're at the stage where we're gonna go ahead and prep the gelatin. So we've got some beautiful dry gelatin. I personally like that better than the sheets, especially for this recipe. I just think it gives a better finish on it. So we're gonna pour in the gelatin, powdered gelatin, right into the water. Water can be room temperature. You don't have to make it hot. Um, if you do choose to heat it up, it'll actually, a little finer particles will go ahead and blend in, but we're gonna mix this in with a spoon. Get this all set, and that's just while our mixture is heating up. So we've got our mixture nice and heating up the cream, and we're gonna go ahead and get this all ready. Set that to the side. We wanna go ahead and transfer it right into the heavy cream before the gelatin's fully set. If it's fully set, remember, the granules are gonna be harder to mix in, so we wanna take this over, back over, nice and hot, and we're gonna pour that gelatin mixture right in. Now get ready with your whisk, and you have to go ahead and give yourself a little bit of a workout, and you're gonna whisk, 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 just so it's all combined, and you don't see giant granules of gelatin in there. So we're gonna go like this, we're gonna whisk, whisk, whisk. Now while you're whisking, you have to think about a couple things. Number one, you gotta taste it. So you gotta get prepped to taste it, and you're tasting to see if you need a little bit more salt, because salt's gonna bring out flavor. Now what's the flavor we wanna add in? We wanna add in that vanilla. The vanilla, you wanna make sure not to add over the heat, because if you do add over the heat, there's a chance if the heat's too high that it could singe a little bit. So we're gonna go ahead and mix, mix, mix. I'm not seeing any chunks in there. I'm not seeing anything together, and most of the reason is because it wasn't set fully yet. So we're gonna mix, 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 and then I'm gonna go ahead and take my vanilla. Now, if you don't have a vanilla bean, which you're gonna scrape, cut in half, and scrape out, go ahead and use some really good vanilla extract. I personally love the uh, bourbon vanilla extract. It's a little aged, and it just tastes a little notch better, right, than regular vanilla. And we're gonna add that in. And that's it. It's an easy recipe, it's delicious. But we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna try it to make sure we don't need a little more salt. So always taste it before, okay. So if I wanna taste a little bit more of the vanilla, I'm gonna go ahead and add some salt to it. And then that's gonna be followed by our wonderful sugar, okay? So we're gonna add all that sugar. Now our mixture is still nice and hot. Now why did I add the sugar after the gelatin? I wanna do that because we've already got it nice and set, so the granules can mix in, the granules can diffuse and kind of melt into the mixture, but our gelatin came first, which is really the most, most important because it's gonna go ahead and set the mixture nice up. Now if you wanted to do a savory panna cotta, which is something also you could do, just omit the sugar. And you can go ahead and add any kind of herbs or flavors that you want to it to make it kind of interesting and a different savory component. All right, so I think we're all set. It is a little frothy, don't worry about that. Not a big deal at all. And go ahead and take yourself a Pyrex again or any kind of measuring cup you have, because if you're like me and a little klutzy, if you try to pour this direction directly into your ramekins, it could go all over the place. 
So we've got some really small ramekins and it's kind of good that you do that because you want them small enough so that they can set fast enough and you don't have to worry about it kind of taking an extra amount of time. We're gonna pour that in right to the top because we're not baking anything. There's nowhere that's gonna go. It's gonna set right where it is. And then we want a little bit of extra room for our garnish on the top. Now the garnish is actually a beautiful fig. If you have fresh figs, use them. Please use them, whatever kind that you can find. If you don't have fresh figs because they're not in season, use some dried. So I'm using dried. My family actually had fig farms in Sicily. And so I was raised with figs. Raised, raised, raised using them. And my family always mixed them with beautiful fresh basil. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna move this a little bit out of the way and while this is actually in the fridge go ahead and chill it needs about I'd say an hour to an hour and a half if you have to rush you've got people coming you're like you know what I need to cheat go ahead and stick it in the freezer for a second all that's gonna do is gonna shock it especially if it's a nice thin ramekin that you're putting in it'll shock it just enough to be able to get set and a skin on it that's gonna be able to hold and support the garnish Okay, so now that we've gone ahead, we're gonna put all of the panna cotta that we just made and portion to little ramekins into the fridge. We wanna let that set for about mm, two hours, maybe, give or take. If you've got people coming and you really wanna rush it, like me, because I wait to the last minute usually on everything when I have guests coming over and I want them to taste this panna cotta, I want you to go ahead and do a little cheat and stick it in the freezer just to still it really, really quickly. That can kind of work for about uh, 10 to 15 minutes and then you can transfer it back to the refrigerator. All right, so now that that's all kind of set and getting prepped, we're gonna go ahead and do our gremolata finish. Now, gremolatas are usually savory. This is actually gonna be a sweet version and that uses my family's kind of recipe which always had figs in it. So usually when you can use a nice fresh fig please do if you don't have them use a dried fig but when you have a dried fig or you have anything dry that's not that's lacking favor but it doesn't have as much as like a nice pungent fresh fig go ahead and think I'm gonna add this to the heat and I'm gonna add a little bit of butter okay now if you don't want to use butter I get it you don't have to you can use a nice oil to it if you like an avocado oil that has a buttery kind of effect to it but what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and put this directly into the heat medium-high and I've already put the butter in there and melted it down to brown butter which makes it even better so we're gonna go ahead and take our pan over beautiful butter what we have is nice unsalted butter just be able to kind of watch the different seasonings so we've got that nice and golden brown now, as soon as it turns golden brown that's your ticket that's when you add in your fig or anything else that you're gonna go ahead and saute up because brown butter can turn black just as fast so we're gonna move it around move it around get it all together and then we're gonna raise our temperature up to high watch it of course and the next part is gonna be where to add a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper, believe it or not. So I know this is a dessert and I know that it's not a nor normal, natural thing to add any pepper, but I'm telling you, a little bit of pepper in the top is just a nice little different flavor that's gonna kind of change it. It's like when people add lavender to things or they add different savory or could be savory seasonings. It just pops it up a little bit in a different way. So we're not looking for anything really to happen to this except for, for it to absorb some of that beautiful brown butter and go ahead and come up to a nice brownish color, which it already is. All right, so now, right now, while we've got actually our figs in the back and they're all simmered in the brown butter, which is delicious, we're gonna get back to the fresh basil. So fresh basil, we're gonna do a quick chiffonade, which means ribbons in French. So all you're doing is you're taking the different leaves off of the stem. You're gonna collect them, you're gonna roll them a little bit, and you're gonna take your knife. Now remember, your knife is held this way. You want your thumb on the blade, you want your index finger on the blade. As I always say, because it's an Italian recipe, um, if you're gonna get into a knife fight, uh, what do you do? Like a vegetable's coming at you, let's say, not a person, but a vegetable is coming at you, you're not gonna hold your knife like this, right, to attack something. You're not gonna hold it back here. You're gonna grip it, you mean business, right? If you hold it like that, you're gonna get nice little callus marks right in there, and you wanna go ahead and have maximum control, which is that's what that will give you, and you're gonna push and pull, push and pull, while you fold over the other fingertips and you walk them back while you cut into ribbons, quarter inch slices. All right, now if you'd like to, you can go ahead and take it and take your knife and go over the top a little bit, because we want this pretty fine, but we don't want to overdo it. Because if you overdo it, all of your oils are on the board, which bothers me as a person because I think all oh, that flavor, all oh, that flavor, that could have gone right into my mixture. So we're going to collect it and then we're going to have a nice little bowl and we're going to put into it the basil. And while it's still hot, because that's what makes all the flavor different, we're going to pour in our figs. 
So if you see our mixture, we've got the figs, a little pepper, a little salt, and our brown butter. And we'll pour that in. And because I don't like to waste any flavor, I'm gonna use a spatula and get that all out. Now, your glue for this recipe, what's gonna bind it together, is gonna be all of that brown butter. So we've got our beautiful mixture right here. It's all together. Now remember, the heat of the figs, that's gonna be what actually gets the oils to start to come out a little bit easier and also to agitate or to mix them up. So we're gonna go ahead and combine these two and it's gonna to start to wilt our basil, which is perfect. And then, last but not least, because I just love the little kind of kick that it gives, I would grab some balsamic glaze. So you can make this yourself. What you wanna do is take balsamic vinegar and you wanna go ahead and reduce it down over medium high heat and a little saucepan. I love saucies because they're rounded and I just feel like it's not gonna burn the edges and it tastes a lot better that way, obviously. And then you're gonna add a little bit of salt to it. Um, and a little bit of uh, brown sugar, just kind of make a nice glaze. Now you don't have to add the sugar because it's got so much sugar in it already that's gonna work down, but I think it tastes better. So we're gonna add about, uh, give or take a tablespoon. It's a taste, mix it around. It's gonna be kind of like another glue, right? Like the butter was, but man, that flavor is just unbelievable. Mix it together, get it all worked together. And then we're gonna set this to the side. So while our panna cotta is getting nice and cold in the refrigerator, when it comes out and we're ready to go, you can either unmold the panna cotta or you can keep it all in the little uh, ramekin that it's in, which I prefer. And you're gonna go ahead and put this on top and it's just beautiful. And actually I would even finish a little bit more pepper and a little bit more salt on top because I just think it makes it tastier, right? All right, that's our panna cotta recipe and we'll get right back to it. All right, so now we're making one of my second, well, my second favorite uh, street food. So if you're walking in Southern Italy, specifically Perugia, this is actually straight from that area originally, you can get a panzerotti. Now panzerotti, panza means little, little belly. And what this is, is a mini calzone, if you want to think of it as far as functionally what it is, but we fry these. And so these are fried usually in street food, uh, street food vending stalls, and then they're nice and they puff up like a little belly does. So what we're going to start with is actually to go ahead and make the dough. So get yourself a nice silver bowl. You want to go ahead and first begin with your dry yeast. So dry yeast you want to pour into warm water to be able to let it go ahead and come together. And we're going to mix that up. And we're going to let that go ahead and just come together so that it will proof a little bit in the warm water, which just means to kind of get it going and get it kind of expressing itself. Now we're going to take AP flour, which is just all purpose flour. So it's not quite as refined as a double O flour would be. Double O flour is wonderful, but you always find that in Italian recipes when they use double O flour, they offset it with a little of semolina or something with a little more grit because that actually is gonna add the balance to it that it will allow it to hold sandwich products. So we wanna go ahead and take our flour, mix it around a little bit, which is my version of going ahead and sifting. I'm not gonna sift this with anything but my hands. And we wanna take a nice hearty pinch of salt. Now you want it to have an equal to that, uh, a teaspoon. I go a little heavy on the salt because I think it adds flavor and adds to the leavening process. So we're gonna go through. I actually also put a little bit of pepper in my dough for the panzerotti because just for flavor, add that through. And then we're gonna go ahead, the first liquid we're gonna have is the fat, which is the oil. So we're gonna go ahead and pour, drizzle the oil over the top of it. Now I am all for using spatulas and mixers, and but traditionally, you really need to get your hands in there. So we're gonna start it, and I'm just gonna take my hand and I'm gonna scoop. So it's a scooping process all the way around. You wanna mix it in so that it's made little pebbles. Pebbles are gonna form from the oil hitting the flour, and you've got your salt and your pepper in here. So very, very simple. And you can see that it starts to chunk up, which is what we want. Don't mix it too, too heavy because you don't want to overwork the flour when you add in the water. But really you can't do that unless you're using a mixer. And that's why I'm kind of saying, don't be too heavy handed with a mixer. You want to make a dough or a well right in the middle of the dough. And you're going to pour in your yeast and water mixture and get it all out. Make sure that you're not missing anything. And then you're going to go ahead. If you can see, I turn my bowl. This is the way my grandma did or my Yona. And so she was the only one in the family as an Italian that could cook really well. We always laughed that my mom, who I love more than anything, can't cook anything, but I was raised in restaurants. And so for this one, we want to go ahead and do it as my Nona did. And she would mix it, mix it, mix it, and then you get into it. And you're gonna use the heel of your hand eventually, but you wanna take it in so it's gonna become a nice rough shaggy dough, which is what you want. And you're gonna crank it so that it all comes together. And then you're gonna put it right onto your board and get it off your hands a little bit. Now you could add a little bit extra flour if you like to, but I say don't make it too dry. And you wanna push into it. So it's a, it's a wrist movement where you're pushing into the dough and you wanna kinda of have it come together. 
and you're looking for the stretch or the bite of the dough. So terrible gluten, which is in this, of course. Uh, Panzerotti is, is nothing but fried gluten, basically, or fried dough, which is fantastic. And so we want to do, we want to work the gluten until it comes together, until you get your chew or your bite. So the gluten, all that is, is going to be what the bite or the, the chew is of your bread. So we want to work this together. Now you're going to probably be working this for about mm, three to five minutes. You're going to work, work, work until this is going to become this. And it's wonderful because it's all a nice solid dough. And if you can see, it pulls from the side of the bowl. Now it doesn't because there's oil in there, it does because it's rested for a while. So you have to go ahead and you have to always rest your dough. And you can see that it's got a nice stick to it. Now what I do next is I take off for Panzerati. You wanna go ahead and make them, probably about 10 will come from this dough. You're gonna take a portion and you're gonna roll it. And because it is so sticky, you probably want a little bit more flour on the side. All right, so we put some AP flour down on the board and we put a little bit on top of our pre-made dough. That's been resting for about, I wanna say, ah, two and a half to three hours. You really wanna go ahead and have it have one to two rises, but for this one, we're gonna do just one. And you wanna get that flour kind of all saturated and put it back on your, on your board. Now, this is what I was talking about. You're gonna do the scoop and push, scoop and push. I remember watching my Nona do this. She's a tiny person. And yet she was so strong, <laughs> she was scoop and push. And you wanna go ahead and work the dough with both hands and kind of have it come together because you want it to be springy. That's the whole point of it. You wanna have a nice spring back on the dough. And then we're gonna take it and when it just comes together, you wanna to be able to stretch it and see that the inside is still nice and moist and it's got, of course, it sticks your hands a little bit, but not as much. All right, so now we're gonna take it, we're gonna rip off, uh, I wanna say about a quarter of it, because this dough has been portioned into two different portions, okay? So you wanna take just enough of it, get to the side, and again, you're gonna need a little bit more flour. Now remember, not too, too much, but all your filling is gonna go on the inside. Now the trick with Panzerati is, it's all about having the little belly or the little puff, which is about frying. So whenever you have hot oil, if you have anything that's gonna seep out or become liquidy, that's gonna go into the hot oil, then you're gonna have a real burning issue because it's gonna pop, it's gonna singe, it's gonna come out, and we wanna make sure that's nice and dry. So we're gonna fold these really, really well. So we're stretching it with our hands to a little circle. You wanna have it kinda of come out to about eh, six to eight inches which is smaller than a calzone. So the difference between a calzone and a panzerotti is the frying, of course, and also the size. So we wanna go ahead and get this all ready. Now this is something that I learned to do, of course, from my family, is we always put a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper on the bottom because you want every single bite to be delicious. So if you only have, let's say, like in a burrito, you have a layer of beans, rice, cheese, and you bite into it and you got one portion. You don't want that in a panzerotti. You don't want that in a burrito for that matter. You want it to be all consumed so that every bite is delicious. So I say season the bottom of it and then you're gonna go ahead and take some garlic, some fresh garlic that we've minced up. And me and garlic, it says that if they tell you two, two cloves, you're gonna use eight, okay? So that's just gotta be the way it is. And then we're gonna go ahead and take our basil leaves and lay them right on top. So again, we've got salt, pepper, minced up garlic, basil leaves, and I'm gonna actually save a couple for the top. And then you're gonna lay down your cheese. Now, why am I not putting the sauce in yet, which is what we're gonna be doing. Some nice tomato basil sauce. You wanna have there be a barrier or a border to keep in the juices, okay, to keep in the moisture. And we're only gonna put, I'd say, about a tablespoon or two of sauce right over the top because you don't need that much. The cheese is gonna melt. The basil is gonna have all of the oils come out and the flavorings. And you wanna go ahead and just have a little packet of joy, basically, where there's a lot of flavors all around. So we're gonna, again, top with a little bit more garlic. And then we're gonna put a little bit of salt and a little bit of pepper right over the top again. So you got flavor, flavor, flavor. Now I would clean off your hands before you fold it because you don't want it getting stuck on the sides. But you're gonna go ahead and put a little bit of flour just on the outsides. And you're gonna take it and you're gonna pull, just like a calzone would. And you wanna pull it on top, pull it on top. If you have any holes, don't worry about it. You're gonna stretch that dough. And if you have to, you're gonna put some flour on the bottom if it starts to stick. No problem. 
and pull, pull, pull. Any open parts, you have to seal up because remember, we don't want it to hit the frying oil. You're gonna get some nice frying oil, which is usually canola, vegetable oil, or you can have a mixture, a blend, which to me is my favorite of a frying oil. You're gonna get that into a nice pot. That's, you know, got a little lower side so that you can go ahead and have a little more surface area because you're gonna only put in about three to four of these at a time, just so you don't overload the frying and lower the temperature at all. So you're gonna get your oil going to about 325, 350. Now remember, if you've got a gas oven or gas stove, you can go ahead and play with the, the temperature. If you've got an electric at home, you have to wash it a little bit because if you notice that these start to get too dark too quickly, and then you flip them even, they're not gonna cook fully on the inside, and you want that too. So if you notice, the dough is actually fairly thin from when I fold it over, which is perfect because you want it to puff up like the little belly, the Panzerati, and you don't want it to be really, really thick and battery. You want it to go ahead and cook all the way through, and it will if it's thin enough. So we're gonna go ahead and get this through, and then we're gonna transfer it to our hot oil, about four or five minutes each side, and get yourself a safe little um, frying tongue or a frying colander, okay? All right. All right, so we've got these all fresh out of the fryer. Remember, it was 350 degree oil, so you gotta make sure that it's hot enough to get this beautiful brown that you've got on it. And if you notice and you look, this is a little puffy, and so that's the belly. That's the port where it calls in, in Panzerati that is nice, the, the tough, the tummy, the big tummy, right? So that's what you develop. Now, if you had baked these, not that it would be bad, it'd still be delicious, but it's not gonna have that puff that you're supposed to have. Now, this is actually a wonderful little sandwich that you can kind of walk around in. That's why it's great as a street food. You can get this when you're walking the streets of Italy just as you can walking the streets of New York. So this is a perfect little snack to kind of have in the middle. You can fill it with anything your heart desires, but I hope you enjoy it. So let's move on to our porchetta which is my absolute favorite and is known in Umbria and Tuscany. So you're going to enjoy it. All right, so we're going to start with my favorite street food that there is, and that's porchetta. And so this actually is in Umbria, Tuscan region. So they've got porchettinis, which are little food trucks, not always little, but pretty small compared to our American food trucks. And they drive around with roasted pork, which is just delicious. And the roasted pork is like a roulade. So roulade is a butterfly piece of pork. So it's cut open, laid out, and you put all these beautiful, flavorful ingredients on the inside. Now, usually it's not too, too thick. It's not too, too thickly filled. It's got sage, it's got rosemary, a lot of herbs, herbaceousness, fennel seeds, 100%. So if you don't like the taste of anise or fennel, I understand, but it is a very traditional Italian, of course. Now my family moved from southern Italy up to Umbria and so in that region you've got these little trucks going around and they actually come by and what you can purchase is a beautiful piece of porchetta that they thinly slice and they put either cold or warm on top of a nice piece of ciabatta bread with a sauce of choice so we're gonna go ahead and make today a delicious porchetta from a wonderful bone-in pork uh, shoulder roast and so this actually if you can see it's got a thick layer of fat don't get rid of the fat please for the love of God don't get over the fat you need that fat Okay, and so that's gonna be basing and it's gonna give a beautiful crackling finish at the end Which is what we want like a mahogany brown So we're gonna really at the very very end we're gonna crank the heat We're gonna get it nice and dark like they would on those trucks So we're gonna go ahead and take this and we're gonna flip it over you can get bone in bone out Like I said boneless is a lot easier because when you're doing the butterfly or the roulade Your knife actually can just keep going and going and going and out 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 without the hindrance of a bone in the middle For flavor though the bone is really where it's at so we're gonna go ahead and I have done this beautiful roulade which means that we take our knife and we thinly sliver, 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 and the meat will roll itself out, okay? Now, after we've done that and it's all splayed out like this, we wanna go ahead and make a nice little pomade finish, basically. So I've got a great olive oil, and we're gonna add to that some lemon zest. Now the zest is where all the oil is. Yeah, you could use juice because juice or any kind of acid brightens the flavor, but we wanna go ahead and get the zest just to kind of calm it down a little bit. We've got fresh rosemary. We're gonna put that in. Get some nice fresh sage. Now you can use dried, don't think that you can't. You can definitely do that if you don't have it on hand. Dried has got more pungent flavor to it than fresh will, but I would like to use fresh for my own. A ton of garlic, please, please, please do a ton of garlic, okay? Because you want that flavor. And we're gonna also add in the most Italian thing that I can think of that can be added to a porchetta, which is uh, dried fennel, okay? Fennel seeds, fresh fennel can be added as well. But remember, fresh fennel, anything fresh that you put in there is gonna add extra moisture, and we want it actually to be nice and moist because of the fat that's in there, and then the fat on the outside is gonna be, like I said before, a dark mahogany crispiness, okay? And so we're gonna go ahead and put in the fennel seed, now it's up to you if you like to add a little bit of heat to it. I do, I just think it balances out a little bit. We're gonna add some chili flakes to it and a lot of pepper. 
and a lot of salt, okay? Be generous, please. And then you're gonna add some nice celery into it. All right, so we're gonna mix this all up. And you wanna make it to become like a little paste, I suppose, just in a little bit, because then you're gonna rub it in. So you've got your pork roulade all out, or I shouldn't say pork roulade, your butterfly pork all out. And if you can see, it's kind of like a little consistency where it's thick enough to be able to hold itself. It's not gonna run out, but it's also gonna be able to really adhere to the center of the pork, okay? So we're gonna put this all on top, and then the fun part starts where you have to rub it in. Okay, so go ahead and get that all in there. And this is gonna be where clean hands come in, um, or if you've got some nice gloves, you're gonna rub it all on the inside. Because remember, this flavor is gonna roast into it, and the more that you can get it all over every part of it, it's gonna bake into the pork, which is what's beautiful about it. Because you gotta think, porchetta is great as a street food or as any kind of a food, because it gets nice and crackly on the outside, so you get the crunch, you get the texture, and then you get the beautiful soft flavor with so many herbs and spices on the inside that it just makes for a beautiful mouthfeel. So you're gonna go ahead and do that and then you're gonna roll it up. Pull all together now and then you're gonna flip it over and remember you want to make sure that your skin side is scored okay so that when it gets nice and crackly it really uh, gets to the the thickness of it inside and you're all good to go. So then we're gonna lift this and you can either twine it or you don't have to but if you want to you can twine it so that it'll actually stay together a little bit easier and you're gonna put it right on to your baking sheet and into your oven's gonna go. Now the cool thing with porchetta is, it's a two-step cooking process. You have to begin by going and put it at about 450 degrees and at 450 degrees for about, uh, give or take 35 minutes, 35 to, to 45 minutes. And you wanna just get a nice crackling and a dark brown skin, just to get it started. And then it's gonna go for about four to five to maybe six hours, depending on how thick that sucker is, okay? And you wanna go ahead and roast it until it's 160 degrees internal temperature. Then when you pull it and you test it, you're gonna probably look at the skin and think I want it a little darker okay so we're gonna put it back into the oven crank the heat all the way up to about 550 600 if you can do it and you're gonna get nice and brown pull it out of the oven which is what we're gonna be doing in a moment and you're gonna let it rest you want to let it rest because as we know the juices will all run out they say that and I'm still very impatient myself so I tend to cut it right when it comes out regardless if you want to do that okay but it just say it's for the chef to taste it and then you can go ahead and try it out uh, and then when it cools enough we're going to slice it and put it into some thick um, beautiful ciabatta bread and enjoy a snack and that's a beautiful street food that you can make in the comfort of your own home so let's go ahead and get this into the oven and to do that we're going to take this one out And here's your prepared porchetta. And you'll see that the skin has turned nice and golden brown, nice and crackling crust on it. If you see the inside of the roulade, which is around, you can see all of the herbs and all of the flavor and definitely the garlic. You should see chunks of garlic in there always, just by visually looking at it. Now I can tell you that right now, if we were to cut it, it, it's just kind of uh, warm on the inside because it wasn't a 550 degree oven, but we did turn off the heat for a moment. So I feel it's pretty safe to cut. So we're gonna go ahead and push this over and we're gonna lift that porchetta right on top. I'm gonna slice it up. So I want you to see really the inside. See how it's kind of all tightly wound up. Now you can tell that this at one point when I made it originally had twine on it to hold it all in. This one is a boneless uh, a pork shoulder. So I want you to see the difference. One bone in, one bone out. Same deliciousness either time. You're gonna take it and you're gonna go ahead. Now usually they would actually uh, cut this about a quarter of inch to a half inch thick. Often they have on these trucks, they have um, electric uh, electric knives and <laughs> I get it just perfectly but if we go ahead and cut it you're gonna cut it right through remember don't saw because when you saw it all falls apart and that is a beautiful porchetta you want to see it now this is gonna get right like this into a giant piece of ciabatta bread now because of how large it is this particular roulade I'm gonna cut that in half and I'm gonna get some bread now you can put a sauce on it, but you don't have to. They actually serve it with or without because the, the juices from the meat are so good and so delicious. It seeps into the bread sometimes. If it's warm, if it's cold, that's the cold sandwiches that they can sell you as well. Those are the ones that usually have a sauce um, with them as well. So we're gonna put this right on top. And you've got yourself delicious street food. Enjoy.
Thank you for joining me today. Look at what we made, all right? We've made our beautiful panzerotti, which you can see that they're still puffed up, which I'm loving. We've got our pancetta, or porchetta rather, and we've got our delicious dessert, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and top off our vanilla panna cotta with a little bit of our fig and basil gremolata. It's right on top of it. If you'd like to see more of me, please visit my website at heatculinary.com uh, or please tune in for the show yet again. Our next episode will be about Scandinavian street food and you're going to love it. A little bit of Abel Skiver can go a long way. So I'll see you soon. Thank you.